All right, we're looking at game two, catching up with the draft. I have to say, I already love T1's draft here. Skarner has a first first pick. You see that Ash is gone. Yone's already been banned. So the big ones are gone off the draft board. Skarner goes. They pick Caitlyn Kindred into it. This is clearly prepared, saying we can just outrange you, and we're going to play with double marksman carries, plus a mage, plus two people to hold the line. This is our formation, this is our team, and we are going to exploit a B1 Skarner pick. It gets followed up with Ash, and, or sorry, with Jax and with Ari, two of the lower range champions in the game. So how do you finish out a draft going from that spot? Especially when Braum comes in right after and saying, I'm going to hold down all of the continuation damage and hold the fort. If you want to try to dive, I already have a preemptive pick against it. I love T1's draft. They end up rounding it out with Silas, who we've seen into Ari. We've seen Ari picked as a counterpick to Silas, and almost every time, the Silas has ended up popping off. Because when you get access to that Ari ultimate at about two or three items, you just snowball through the fights. We'll see if that happens again. I love this red side draft. And we've seen it before. Counterpick to carry out. This time, instead of going for counterpick, they just say, we're counterpicking your comp. We know that you're going for full-on dive, so we're going to go anti-dive. Pick Brom now, and then pick your poison. There's something you're going to leave up on the other side. It's Maokai and Silas. Silas is going to be able to pick up some of these high-profile ultimates. The big thing for Gen.G is your team is higher damage overall. There is more damage here in the composition. This is one of the stronger states of Caitlyn. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see first item collector or infinity edge at this point. Infinity edge first because you get all the access to all the headshots. Going for the extra damage, but a lot of times they end up going with collector. We'll usually get an idea based on the rune. This is fleet footwork, so I think it makes it more likely that she goes with infinity edge. We see more collector going with first strike, which I'm not that big of a fan of, even though in solo queue it might be very good. <clears throat> This game is going to come down to Kindred. Kindred countering. Look at this lane swap ward being put into position. This is old school. Uh, change in the map. The old ward positions that you used to be able to get out, not all identical to what they were in Season 4. But I do like seeing team move, get a quick ward over here. We'll see if he swaps it out or whether he, whether he stays on the map. A lot of junglers have been keeping their yellow trinkets much more often ever since the changes to the sweeping lens that it just doesn't give you as much of a duration, as much freedom going forward. And the idea that you want to protect yourself and you want to know for your team, like drop a ward that helps your laners out, it's a little bit more valuable than making your own gank better. All right, what kind of adaptations do we hear? Do we see? We're swapping and swapping there. It looks like they're trying to get Caitlyn into Jax. No, they're saying we can just match. Are we going to get a 3v2 here in the mid lane? So... Experience sharing, it's worth mentioning this for a little bit. Just a little chart, a cannon is worth 100 XP. When you go and you get that solo, you get 95 XP. You get 95% of all the experience. When you share, this actually balloons into... So when you can share experience in the early game, you want to because it's going to generate more experience for your team. And that's why you see these double mid lanes and hold on, we'll see the answer right here. They catch Brahm on a rotation and it looks like they might just get a free first blood on this. They try to give it to Kaisa long range, but 4v1, now Zeus is in trouble. So adaptation, Zeus, can he plug this wave? I don't think. And his Q actually misses some of the minions there in the back meaning that they're going to be alive for even longer. So they're going to take more. Canyon survives flashing out at the last frame there. Can he get a cooldown up? He cannot. They give the Kaisa the kill. Three people limping away, two plates in the bot lane, and a wave that's going to be bouncing back. Lehenz is going to make sure of that. I love this teleport here. You come right back and you say, I'm picking up the most of this possible. Maybe that's why Maokai didn't want to queue in a way that would hit more of the later. Uh, interesting, interesting. I... I'm surprised that T1 did not spend the time to get Caitlyn into the lane with Kaisa. 
because that's absolutely what you want. You are trying to get into that spot and you want to dominate, especially with this fleet footwork. Rune, I wouldn't mind you playing into Jax, but you just have to be very careful with Jax on the leap strike, counter strike. All right, taking stock of the rest. Baker gets a small XP lead here compared to Chovy. Where do we keep on moving? We have the marks up. Kindred's going to have a tough time finding marks to start the game, uh, but has been doing fine. The big benefactor, whenever there's a big lane swap or a big dive like this, one of the big benefactors can be your jungle carry. So all in all, even though we do see tank, you know, Maokai and Braum dying, it's Maokai and Braum. Those are the two people that you didn't care about being on the map as long. You want Caitlyn and Silas getting maximum resources, Kindred getting maximum resources. Hold on, they're going for another dive here. Wait. Nice job there by, by Canyon. Tucking the mouse, you know, when you're going forward, if this is you on the projectile, you want your mouse to be like behind your back pocket. That's the way to get the fastest turnaround. One of the reasons why pros do better on this champion than the masses is that turn radius, you know, the decision tree, the entire time you're, you're opting into what is the best way to do this. Chovy opting for grasp. I'm just seeing this now. Grasp saying, I'm going to exploit the Silas matchup, who is trying to trade his health for my mana, right? And he's trying to do that early and often to create pushes. That's something that you need to do is use these resources to get some amount of push and threat, and you chunk them down to the point where maybe you can get an all-in trade. Ari is saying, I can combat that by going Grasp and stacking up. I don't think this is going to mean we're going to see like a Rift Maker or anything later, but this could easily be an extra 150, C, uh, 150 HP by the end of the game. Could be the difference between staying alive that much longer in a fight. We'll see if that comes up. Chovy pressing up and doing Chovy things, queuing once through the wave and then stepping forward to try to deny as long of a recall as possible. Good job again by T1, right? When you leave from mid, someone should already be there to pick it up. You never want those minions touching your turret. Silas teleports to the top side, perhaps over eagerly, uh, but it looks like Kaisa is going to be in a rush to try to push this wave. And so Silas says, hey, here's the play, guys. This is the play. They don't know about the control ward here in the tribush, though, but it may not matter. Owner's going to give up the gig. It's warded. So here we go. E into W into E2. Flashing away. I actually would have liked to see Silas flash forward to ensure to connect that. Or connect the rest of the fight. Or even... Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you don't know enough about what's going on in the river, so maybe you just say, all right, we've got Kaisa's Flash. But that took a while. Again, you see, pings. This guy was pinging, and it took a minute to get the team into, into position coming over. Um, if that's the case, that, that is potentially damning for T1. The longer the series go, if you're having communication issues, the more volatile it can be. Baker overstepping here, uses the Kaisa ultimate to step across, but this is just going to him. He's going to try to give the kill to someone like the Rel, but they do give it to Kaisa. Pays is going to be huge on this champion. He has gotten pentakills on Kaisa before, so we will see if he can do it again. So a little bit disjointed again from here. And it makes you wonder, right? We have this team that you say it's these four with their leader. By a lot, a lot of people's measures, Faker has not been playing to the same level, to his own standard. He's dropped off, and he, he's just an average mid laner in Korea now. Does there ever come a point, if you're a T1 player, where you say, man, it's my time to shine. It's my time to, to do this. I want to be the one that gets the call. Generally, that's a super toxic thing. You, you tend to see that with wide receivers and, and quarterbacks in, in the NFL. It's my time. Like, I'm open. Like, give me the ball. And, and you make it hard for your leader when they're responsible for making all the decisions for the team. Hold on, Skarner with another move. This time Kindred's here to answer. Maokai's trying to peel off as much as possible. You see him blocking, keen blocking, and Kindred's there to answer. This is what you want, by the way. If you're playing Kindred into Skarner, you keep on farming. You don't need to take any fights. Hold on. This is against, against the narrative. You have to be really careful with this. They're, they continue the fight. Maokai says, yeah, I'm strong enough. And Kindred is strong enough. Also has access to the Lamb's Respite. So uh, they know that they can take this without risking anything else. Holds it, holds it, holds it. Couldn't get that Q forward to land on Canyon. So the call was correct. Uh, they had enough information on the other champions, the other players across the map. Chovy with no teleport. 
which means that they continue this play. So really good job on a high pressure. I would not have seen that in the moment. That always feels bad when, when you go for that. When you go for that last turret hit and you can't quite get it, it looks like you didn't have enough mana. In other situations, if you have more mana, you go and you hit and you W out. Nice job by Keen pulling this out. Now, this is a little bit of a bluff. Caitlyn's low on mana, which I don't like that she's this low. And it's sort of, when you go this rune page, that oftentimes has presence of mind and mana flow band, right? I don't really like the mana flow. I like to have it absolute focus and gathering storm to make sure that you've got maximum AP for later, or even celerity in some games where you just need to kite away from something like that's diving into you like this. This celerity can be good. I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, to snipe the page that Guma's playing with. But if you don't have someone to lane against, then you are negating Caitlyn of a lot of her prowess. You're taking away one of the things that she does best, which is to bully the lane. We haven't seen Caitlyn be able to do that much. In fact, is lower on CS than the Kai'Sa. So this is definitely a mistake from T1. The coaching staff is going to want to look at this, say, hey, how did we end up in this spot? And diagnose and go. We mentioned it yesterday. It's worth mentioning at least once uh, with each match. When you're coaches, it, it becomes, you know, we love to see that coaches cam and they get super hyped up about the game. Game five is the only time that a coach should get hyped because your pre-game, post-game speeches, those should all be prepared. Those are last night. You have them, they're ready, they're, they're in your pocket. Maybe you even keep notes to remind yourself as the team comes, comes back in, what do I want to talk about in these stages? When it's game one, game two of a series, there's more series to play. Your team is depending on you to be the eyes to see what they could not see during the game. You need to see, like, if, when you're in the painting, you can't see the painting. If you're the protagonist of, of, or if you're a statue, you can't appreciate the statue. If you're in the game, you can't see the game. You're looking and you can see minimap, but you can't see the way that a coach will be able to watch and tell you, hey, look, this is the timing that they got this ward down. This is the timing that they went for a week. If we want to go for a lane swap, let's make sure that we're ready for that 44 second ward from Kindred, right? And that sort of window matters because not only is it when does it go down as far as when will they see us and we trap them on the way there, but also when does it dissipate the 90 seconds plus the two second runoff, right? So if you know the exact moment when they're dropping a ward and you can predict that, then you can also know the exact moment when that ward is gone and you can potentially come up with some sort of exploit that will answer it. This game, they caught Braum, they had the jump on Maokai, they had a big advantage and they've been looking to snowball from there because of how strong Kaisa has been. That's the role of the coach. Game to game, you prepare the team. You make sure to get your players in the best position because it's the players that have to win the game. It's not the coach. The coach is just going to tell you, here are the things that you can do. Here are the advantages that you can clean for yourself. Now it's up to you to go do it. And then you heighten their, their performance level, as we heard from Mata in the beginning. If you think they're shaky, you address that first. If your team's not playing well. You have to address that. It looks like, and they'll know much better than I will, but there looks to be like a certain amount of strain on the face of Zeus and Faker as they just show the player cams. We already saw split comms twice in game one and a, and a delay on comms in game two. That would be a bigger issue, right? So if you're a coaching staff and they come to you and address like, hey, we're, we're having split communication issues, that comes over everything, right? You need to say, we need to communicate as a team. Reminder, trust ourselves. These are our brothers. We work together. We've done this the whole year. Guma has perhaps the healthiest approach I've ever heard an AD carry say. Unprompted, coming into an interview saying, we'll win this together. You're the guy who's supposed to like carry these games. But, but having the wherewithal to know like, hey, it's on our team. Like our team can do this together. I can rely on my teammates. That is an invaluable skill for an AD carry to have. And it allows you to play with a supreme level of confidence because you know that they've got your back. You've got their back. You're a team, you do this together. All right, Superfed Kaisa ends up dodging out. He's going to get the kill on Braum. Kindred keeps him alive. They actually might be able to get a significant amount of damage back here. Halen does... Interesting by the uh, tanks making way for that to hit. But uh, good play by Kindred. Braum doing just enough. You end up getting the Kaisa ultimate and the cleanse. So we've got a three-minute window here that T1 is going to try to exploit. 
expect them to play very aggressively, especially when it comes up to this dragon. Will they go for Rift Herald? They're the outranging team. They can play They can play for long game scaling. They don't need to take anything. Kindred's going to continue getting bigger, although it's almost impossible for her to find her marks. She's only got two. Very difficult to get it. You don't really want to step into the enemy team territory. This is a loaded game, right? Because just look at position by position, the damage and threat is much higher on Gen G, except here. And what you're saying is we can take you from long range, long range. These two guys are going to pocket like this and say, we dare you to come for, or they go like this. You get rid of these and you say, we're going to be on front and Silas looks to flank. These are the two different positions that are really available to these teams as they set up for team fights. And who's going to puncture it? Is it going to be puncture, puncture, and then come over the top hammer to anvil sort of strategy? Gen G needs to be spending all, all of this time thinking about how are we actually going to get through on this team fight because it's very clearly going to have to be dive onto backline type strategies, otherwise, you get ripped apart. Nice little pick there on the rel. Uh, again, we saw from what we saw last game that rel was over, over preparing on what an anticipated strong side play would be. And if, a, if you see that and you say, hey, we can exploit this, we can actually beat this play. If they step forward in this same way, we can go catch them. They're going to be alone. If we go one minute, 15 seconds before the dragon, we can anticipate that they're there. Skarner just steals it and flashes out. Beautifully done by Skarner. Most importantly, no one else needed to come to this. And look at all the investment. The time that they spent to go kill the Rel. Two control wards. They do end up getting a push from themselves in the bot lane turret. If you were the team that said, I will let you spend time to go get dragon, then you'd be very happy getting getting a turret but in a case where they just steal the dragon from you they got the rift herald and you only got a turret in response that is a huge win for Gen G. not only that but getting a second charge off so uh, we were worried that genji was going to be a little bit frazzled after a pick in the jungle he's still no cleanse for it uh, but they end up finding the place and you know skarner just gives that much safety that champion can do so much Speaking of Skarner, this is going to be a Randuin's Omen, the, the best way to answer against these two champions. The Asylus to threaten from there on out. So as a frontliner, you don't care if you're toe-to-toe -to -toe with Silas because your team will be ripping the Silas apart. You just need to make sure that you're not taking damage from the ranged carries here. But I absolutely love this Randuin's. I expect to see Frozen Heart as well, which does have value against Silas. Frozen Heart not nearly as strong as it has been historically but still plenty of an item to get you through this game if they can get Skarner to that super tanky position. Thornmail might even come out as well. You see multiple, uh, multiple avenues of healing, basically from everyone. I expect it from everyone. We're going to have Font of Life, Fleet Footwork, plus some sort of healing item later. Silas with the Kingmaker, Kindred on his own and being in the jungle. Maokai, Grasp, and his, his passive. So there's healing across the board. I do want to see a Thornmail at some point. But the question, you know, it's not about the damage. It's about the healing reduction. If, if, are, are they going to be able to skip hitting the Skarner is the question. And if that's the formation that they come up with where it's like, hey, no, we're diving. We don't need to worry about them, like, tapping me for any amount of time. I'd rather just have my maximum effect when I'm diving. Then 100% having the slow aura is going to be bigger and being able to have the active on Randuin's Omen to create some space for your team and say, hey, we're gonna slow you down. That's gonna give us the avenue to get into the fight because if any type of collapse, I mean, if T1 basically can never take the fight on Skarner, they just can't do it. They can rip into him with, with guns, you know, but that's it. Because if they ever try to collapse, Rel, Rel comes in, Kaisa you know, Ari front to back, like this, this team will be insane if it just gets to pile drive through you. I anticipate it's going to be press forward, press forward, press forward, dive over to the back line and pinch, right? Like they're going to try to punch straight through the Maokai Braum to try to get to the guns and they have the access, right? Skarner can go through the fight. Ahari can dash through the fight. Jax can flank. And with all of those, all you need is one of them to hit one of their crowd control abilities to get Kaisa onto the other side, reposition the fight. Uh, that said, it is a high octane, high pressure strategy. 
T1 will constantly be looking to bait you into a preemptive action where you're not quite in position the way that you thought you might have been, right? And if you can get them to overstep, then you can consolidate backwards, peel back front to back, use Maokai ultimate at the right time, probably at a 45 degree angle to cover as many of the approaches as possible, or maybe even casting it backwards in rare situations. Uh, there's a world where that could happen, right? And if, if the enemy team does not execute to the level that they, that they need to, then that could be a very big problem for them. All right, the battle for the ward, battle for Baron. Look at all the control wards going down. Blue ward, normally I like waiting to 20 minutes to take this. It looks like they just took it just a moment ago and the buff is still there. Uh, it's generally worth waiting. You have other camps that you could have taken that are, that are more experience and gold in the case of Gromp. You can wait for those. Maybe they want the, the hindered respawn to be on a specific camp. That is something you can do, by the way. Uh, in pro games, you can clear five of your camps and leave wolves or krugs and say, I, you know, I, or especially, especially wolves, I dare you, Kindred, to come to my wolf camp if you want your mark. And you can just let it sit there. And you can guard it, right? You can even put like a control word right there, for example, and say, I dare you to come get this mark. We'll never touch it. I'll leave it here. You're never going to get it. There's pros and cons, right? There's pros and cons to every strategy. All right, Lahen's feeling super aggressive here, can move up. Jax already has a flanking position. Maokai had to go pick up the wave, so he's going to come back. It is heavily favored to Gen.G right now, as you can see on the AWS win probability, but they still have to be the team to execute. They have higher damage. They can make this happen. The T1 team, though, is just going to keep on playing safe, keep on playing back. Once Caitlyn's on Infinity Edge, and this is the main reason I don't like Collector, by the way, because it does diddly to this guy. You can get stoned by the Skarner. If you had gone Infinity Edge, then maybe you can get you can get bigger chunks off of the one headshot that you get, off of the trap that the Skarner comes and takes down when you do put that line down. Collector becomes much more about the spells, and you're just never connecting these spells on anyone who matters. But Gen.G is going to look to try to get more and more space. They already took the beach. Now they're going to look to step up a little bit and see if they can take the level two in the jungle. Right now, they've, they're level one in. We call the levels like basically the beach level. Then you have the middle two and three. So these three different depths going through the jungle is the amount of threat that you can mitigate from the enemy team. And once you get into level two, you can essentially start taking all the camps. Level three is essentially just when it comes time to break down the turrets in the base a little bit for the rotations between the inner turret defenses. But it's going to be tough on T1, you know, to hold this on. What are their avenues? How can they make this happen? Again, they're just going to be super patient, but you see that they're losing more and more resources. Genji is going to take more and more. They're going to try to balloon their leads, play off of spikes. They're constantly pressing tab, constantly trying to get information about where their advantages might be. The later the game goes, the more the Kindred becomes a problem. The more the Caitlyn becomes a problem, being long range. I like that Kaisa's going for the on hit, maximum front to back damage, which means that they really just want to plow through the fight. Uh, it might also mean that they just want to stack up Rage Blade and have her jump onto the far side with a stacked up Rage Blade. Try to go for a big proc right at the end. But mostly that you do this for being able to rip through the Maokai or the Braum. So this might be an adaptation. They might say, hey, we can actually take you in front to back just because we're bigger. And we don't need to make this big colossal diving play because we're ahead. If you try to stand off against us, we're just going to continue walking forward. So start looking at Genji's positioning, whether or not they go with two vanguards, go for the flank, or if they just start pushing up. You see Lehens being super aggressive with their positioning. Thundered Sky picked up by Jax. He is now unstoppable in the side lane. Fimble Winter from Maokai. He'll be able to clear these waves, but he can never match the Jax for a fight. He basically just needs to heal and run away. Uh, always be the second one to, to the action. And basically for the rest of the game, expect him to be pinned to this part of the map. Now the problem with this strategy also for Maokai, you're getting like the tail end and you're forcing yourself to cover long enough where you're actually missing resources in the bot side as well. Like Keen's not missing anything right now. He's taking the wave that you push out to him. He's throwing it right back at you. 
he knows that he's getting 100% of it every single time, whereas Maokai might miss it because he's forced to, like, rotate and cover for the Caitlyn, especially any time that the Caitlyn wants to go forward. Because of this big lead, you see that Jax and Kaisa can push their lanes first, which pushes the line of scrimmage deeper into the map and allows you to react further and further right here. That's what they're doing step by step. They, I love this play. They're just taking maximum resources off the map, being slow and patient, uh, ballooning their lead. But you, have to, you do have to remember, there is a point. This is going to win. So they, they have to be looking pretty soon about pulling this trigger. It may come up in a minute, 20 seconds, forcing enemy team to come here. They might stick Jax on the dragon and put four people on the Baron and say, which one are you going to defend? We're strong enough as four to just hold you here. Jax can take the dragon. If you try to go to, to Jax, he'll teleport to us. We'll take the Baron, and then we definitely will win the game in that period. Infinity Edge. Braum gets the shield up. Tons of damage. He gets ripped through by the Kaisa. Ari, some amount of true damage as well. They reap the rewards of, of that consistent, gradual gain in, in the jungle. And now this is going to be it. They're going to go for the, for the Baron. All signs point to T1 wanting to full defend this, which means Keen is going to go and just seal off the back door. You see him walking up behind. He's trying to stone the backside. The best play from T1 would be to go engage. Keen did just walk into Control Ward's vision. They could have turned around and did to him what they did to Bin, but it looks like Zay's trying to get in. This is not looking good. This is looking like a free free win for Genji. Uh, much would have preferred that they that they pulled together the shot call that was used against Bin yesterday, even though it didn't do too much. But turn around. Their, their best chances of winning were at 100% when they turned around and killed, killed the Jacks. But now they get everything. They move the fight together. They're walking up together. This is, this is going to be disaster. This game will not be much longer. Baron up minions. We're going to see them tank up. The uh, Voidlings are actually going to do a good job for you, keeping the minion wave alive a little bit longer. Birds are always going to prefer dealing damage to those. Gives you more time to go kill them. So they might look for the end right now. You've just got Maokai. No, they pull out. They pull out, say, we can take we can take Baron and Dragon, and we absolutely still win the game. So there's no reason to make any sort of any sort of maybe play where maybe they hero outplay us. The game was checkmated. They could have done it with good execution, but I agree with this call. It's Hextech Soul, after all. You Now you've got Baron, you've got Hextech Soul, you broke in, you broke the inhibitor. Now they can set up for a 1-4 split push. Jax is going to be on one side, weak side, to the Elder. The rest of the team is going to be strong side. The reason for doing that is making sure that you prepare. Let's look at this line of scrimmage. Keen jumping out. Gets a stun here, but nothing more. It doesn't go for more. Expertly stepping away. I don't know if he knew that Braum was there. Look at how much space he bought for his team there. Take the rest of the fight. Runner jumps in, flash W as we see often. The flash W into the ultimate means that you can hit that. <clears throat> Not getting greedy, going for the target right in front of you. Scooping up an extra one is just bonus. Mata is feeling it. Lol Park in Korea. Jack stepping on a trap. I don't know if they're trying to bait something there, but they don't need to be baiting. They're actually going for five-man push. They're saying, we're not, we're not going to give you any windows. We're just going to five-man with Baron. We're going to meet our supers here in the mid-wave. And you basically can't ever go and defend because we've got the five people here. I actually like this. 4-1 would have been slower, more methodical, but it allows the enemy team to maybe get a window to go after you. But especially with the teleports being used to get into position, you can't go for 4-1 anymore. You have to put everyone in. All right, here we go. The last hoorah. Maokai's going in, but they have to look at all that damage from the Hextech. Oh my gosh. The whole team from a static shiv proc and Hextechs, the, ha the team's at 40% health. They can't do anything. There's just no contest here. Absolute stomp. Genji.